I'm Dr. Caroline Fife from the Memorial Hermann Hospital in Houston, Texas. I've been using transcutaneous oximetry, often known as TCOM, or more accurately, TCPO2, for the past 20 years. Transcutaneous oximetry is a non-invasive way to measure the oxygen tension, that is the partial pressure of oxygen in the skin. The four applications of TCPO2 we will discuss in this video are assessing the wound healing potential, screening for vascular disease and or assessing the success of revascularization, predicting amputation level, and predicting the benefit of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I will refer to evidence-based interpretation guidelines developed by an expert panel and published in the Journal of Undersea and Hyperbaric Medicine. First, let's briefly review just what it is we are measuring. My home in Houston, Texas, and here in Stockholm, where we are making this video, are exactly at sea level, where the total atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Since 21% of that is oxygen, the inspired partial pressure of oxygen is 160 millimeters of mercury. This is diluted in the lungs with water vapor and carbon dioxide so that if we were to measure the oxygen partial pressure in the arterial blood, it would be approximately 100 millimeters of mercury. Oxygen is then carried via the vasculature to the tissues, where it is possible to measure its diffusion through the skin using a heated electrode to 44 or 45 degrees centigrade. The transcutaneous oxygen tension in a normal person is about 70 millimeters of mercury. Values lower than 40 millimeters of mercury are associated with impaired wound healing, and values lower than 30 millimeters of mercury are indicative of critical limb ischemia. But it is important to know that a low value could have other causes besides vascular disease. For example, the patient's inspired PO2 could be low, perhaps because they live at altitude, or their arterial PO2 could be low due to pulmonary disease. They might have a poor oxygen delivery mechanism due to heart failure or peripheral vascular disease. Or lastly, they may have a barrier to oxygen diffusion to the electrode due to edema or inflammation. A best practice suggestion is to check the patient's oxygen saturation using pulse oximetry to ensure that arterial hypoxemia is not the reason for a low TCPO2 reading. Now let's discuss using TCPO2 to assess wound healing potential. On the foot, while breathing normobaric air, that is air at ambient atmospheric pressures, the average TCPO2 in a healthy person is always greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. Values in healthy people are usually a bit lower on the foot than they are on the leg. 38 studies since 1982 suggest that hypoxia sufficient to impair or prevent wound healing is defined as a TCPO2 less than 40 millimeters of mercury. So TCPO2 values obtained while breathing normobaric air can be used to predict which wounds will not heal spontaneously. Because tissue hypoxia leads to healing failure, it is easier to determine a value below which a wound will not heal than to identify a value above which a wound is reliably predicted to heal. This is because wound healing can be impaired by many factors other than hypoxia, such as the patient's nutritional status, diabetes control, medications, and many other things. Now let's discuss screening for vascular disease or assessing the success of revascularization. Patients with critical limb ischemia will almost always have a TCPO2 less than 30 millimeters of mercury and often less than 20 millimeters of mercury. However, as we've already mentioned, low pressure values can also have other causes. So how can you know if the low values you see on a patient are due to arterial disease? The best way is to use an oxygen challenge test, which involves having the patient breathe 100% oxygen via a non-rebreathing face mask. 
This way, you can determine whether the low values are due to a reversible oxygen barrier, such as edema, inflammation, or macrovascular disease. In healthy people breathing 100% oxygen at normobaric pressure, TCPO2 values always increase to greater than 100 millimeters of mercury. Such a response to breathing oxygen indicates that significant macrovascular disease is not likely. An increase in TCPO2 when breathing normobaric oxygen that is less than 30 millimeters of mercury is consistent with severe arterial disease. These patients should undergo further vascular assessment if it has not already been performed. If the patient undergoes revascularization and their TCPO2 value breathing normobaric air has then increased to greater than 40 millimeters of mercury after the procedure, they are highly likely to heal. This is true whether the revascularization was done by surgery or endovascular methods. However, the increase in baseline pressure values after revascularization may be delayed, so post-revascularization TCPO2 studies should not be performed until at least three days after the procedure, and preferably more than a week. The reason is that TCPO2 values can continue to increase for as long as 28 days after revascularization. The next topic is predicting amputation healing. Unfortunately, many patients with leg ulcers require amputation. The goal is for the amputation to be performed at the most distal level possible in order to maintain the best possible function. However, the more distal the amputation, the more likely the surgery is to fail. So TCPO2 can be used to find the optimal level of amputation hopefully preventing failed surgeries. A normobaric air TCPO2 value less than 40 millimeters of mercury is associated with a lower than normal likelihood of amputation healing. In other words, if possible, recommend an amputation at a level where TCPO2 value is greater than 40 millimeters of mercury. An oxygen challenge can be of some help here. If the baseline TCPO2 increases less than 10 millimeters of mercury while breathing normobaric oxygen, this is a highly reliable way to predict failure of amputation at that level. In fact, this test is at least 68% accurate in predicting failure of healing after an amputation in patients for whom revascularization is not possible. So if possible, recommend amputation at a level where the oxygen challenge increase is greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. But remember that an increase of 10 millimeters of mercury represents a really poor oxygen response and confirms that the patient has severe vascular disease. <music> Lastly, Let's discuss predicting benefit from hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Transcutaneous values obtained while breathing normobaric air cannot be used to predict benefit from hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The sea level oxygen challenge test is also not an accurate predictor of hyperbaric benefit. The best way to predict benefit from hyperbaric therapy is using in-chamber TCPO2. If the in-chamber TCPO2 value is greater than 200 millimeters of mercury, this indicates that the patient is likely to heal with hyperbaric therapy. Conversely, in-chamber TCPO2 values less than 100 millimeters of mercury are closely associated with the failure of hyperbaric therapy. The in-chamber TCPO2 test is 75% accurate at predicting benefit from hyperbaric therapy. Although these data come from diabetic foot ulcer studies, they seem to apply to other types of wounds. That brings up some final comments regarding TCPO2.
TCPO2 is a screening test. It is meant to be used as a guide to decision making, taken in context with the other information you have available. Furthermore, what we have described over the past few minutes is a stepwise decision process. That is to say, you first perform a TCPO2 study to determine if a patient is likely to heal spontaneously. If their values are low, you would then perform a normobaric oxygen challenge. A poor response may indicate the patient has significant arterial disease, and your next step would be to order a more definitive test of the anatomy, like an angiogram. After revascularization, you might repeat the TCPO2 study. If the normobaric air values are still low, then you might consider an in-chamber test to determine whether hyperbaric oxygen therapy would be helpful, assuming the patient meets the criteria for this treatment. It will not be possible to perform one transcutaneous study and obtain all possible answers to all questions. Current evidence-based guidelines by every major professional organization emphasize the importance of vascular screening for all patients with non-healing leg ulcers. As a clinician, if you develop a protocolized approach for performing transcutaneous oximetry on all your leg ulcer patients, your confidence in this technology will increase and your patient outcomes will improve. Clearly, there is much more that we could discuss, but we hope this brief presentation has made you feel more confident in interpreting transcutaneous oxygen studies and will increase your utilization of this technology in caring for your patients. I'm Dr. Caroline Fife. Thank you for your attention.